Do they, the members of the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, believe that their religion is the true? Do they think that they have the one and only true religion backed by Almighty God? That's what I'll be talking about today on the Jexit podcast. Hello and welcome to the very first episode of the new Jexit podcast. I'm your host, Riley, a former Jehovah's Witness who left the religion in 2019. Before we get into today's episode, I just want to thank you all very much for tuning in. I'm trying my hands at something new with this audio-only podcast. I've been planning it for some time now and I've finally gotten around to it. For those of you unfamiliar with my work, I have a YouTube channel called Jexit 2020, where I interview other former Jehovah's Witnesses, or XJWs as we call ourselves, and I also comment on JW policies and doctrine. Now, admittedly and somewhat embarrassingly, things have been a little quiet on my channel recently. Not because I've run out of things to talk about, but simply because video production is such a lengthy, and time-consuming process, and all too often, life just gets in the way. Besides all of that, I've had a ton of technical issues with video and recording equipment. I won't bore you with the details, but suffice it to say, they really have put a spanner in the works for my YouTube channel. So I thought to myself, I still want to produce content, and an audio podcast would allow me to do that much more quickly and frequently. I haven't given up on my YouTube channel, but I'm still working out how that will fit into my overall content strategy going forward. And that is why we are now here on the Jexit podcast. I'm certain this question has been a subject of debate ever since the first two XJWs had a conversation about their former religion. Personally, it's something that I've given a considerable amount of thought to. And I'd also like to know what others in the XJW community think about this. So a couple of weeks before recording this episode, I ran a poll on Twitter asking this question. Do the members of the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses genuinely believe they have the one true religion? And these are the results after 253 votes. 30.4% of respondents said yes, they believe it. 25.7% said no, they are con men. And 43.9% say they're a mixture of both. So the majority of the 253 people who voted on this poll believe that they're a mixture of both. Some of them are con men and don't believe it at all. Some of them truly believe it. But when you look at the results overall, it is quite close. It's quite an even split between the three opinions. So in my mind, there's no clear, decisive answer. In addition to voting on the poll, a few people also left comments. And here are just a few of the comments I received. So Matt underscore abstract says, I think they are egotistical enough to believe the doctrine. They don't live in extravagant luxury like big televangelists, so I just can't imagine it's worth it to knowingly lie that much to not actually believe. But they're also elderly guys who are decades in, so who knows? Now that is a really interesting opinion. The governing body, especially in recent years, are very similar to the American televangelists that we're used to seeing on TV. Except when it comes to money. These televangelists live very opulent lifestyles and they're not afraid to show it either. They're always flying all over the world in private jets, dripping with jewellery, fleets of cars and things like that. But the governing body aren't necessarily like that. So it does seem like money isn't their motivation. So if not money, then what? What other than money would be worth lying for? That's an interesting question. I don't have the answer because I'm not a member of the governing body. And I don't necessarily agree 100% with this opinion, but it is a very interesting opinion to consider. 
Incidentally, Matt underscore abstract on Twitter, who left this comment, was very influential in my waking up process when I first left the organization. He doesn't make YouTube videos anymore, but his channel is still live and it's called Irregular Pioneer. And his videos were so helpful to me when I was first waking up. And they're very much still worth watching. Okay, the next comment is from stick underscore pins. And that says, they know too much about the inner workings to think they're directed by God, but also think they're right. That's a really interesting comment. And it's one that I think I kind of lean towards as well. Knowing what I know now about the organization, if I had ever reached the lofty heights of becoming an elder while I was still in, I think I would have seen through the lies and the deception pretty quickly. Okay, the next comment is from Twitter user Harriet Tubbs said, and their comment is, they definitely know it's a con. That's why they were selected. <laughs> That's really funny. We can't keep thinking these people don't know and are just so innocent. That's getting people killed and abused. I don't know why they aren't banned already. Some very strong feelings there. The next comment is from Lindis and the comment says, I think at the very least they believe they're justified due to it being the truth, but know what they're doing is wrong still. That's a really good opinion. And if that were the case, it would explain an awful lot. Sometimes individuals, organizations, and governments do things that are at best morally ambiguous, at worst, outright despicable. And they do these things knowing that they're wrong, but they believe they're for the greater good. So they do them anyway, and that's their justification. It's very possible that the organization, the governing body, uh, work along the similar lines. Okay. And the last comment is from Linz Rojo and it says, I go back and forth on this one. I feel like it's similar to a pyramid scheme. At some point, when you get to the tippy top of the pyramid, you find things out. There's a fork in the road and you have to make a decision to stop or keep going. That's also a very interesting opinion. That describes well the sunk cost fallacy that all Jehovah's Witnesses have to some degree, where they may come up against doubts or misgivings about the religion and the organization as a whole, but they feel they've invested too much in it to stop or leave. So they keep going. So those are just a few of some of the comments that I got on this poll. Now I have my own opinions about the answer to this question. But I have to say that my answer now in 2024 is quite different than it would have been just a year ago. If you'd asked me this question a year ago, I would have said they're a mixture of both, but with the qualifier that most of them are probably true believers. Why would I have answered this way? Well, I strongly believe that when it comes to religion, politics, or anything that relies on human thought and feelings, there's no such thing as a purely homogenous group. In any such group, you'll get a spectrum of ideas, opinions, allegiance, and levels of devotion. And as much as we flawed human beings tend to stigmatize groups of people we dislike and tar them all with the same brush, this no doubt applies to the governing body too. As unscrupulous as they are as individuals and as a group, it's reasonable to conclude that they are not completely united in thought. This is evidenced in the fact that they have to vote on doctrinal and policy changes with a two-thirds majority being needed to pass any such change. They don't all think the same. Now, the reason why I would have said in the past that most of them are probably true believers is because up until relatively recently, the JW leadership seems to have a policy of strict adherence to their beliefs, regardless of how that could impact the size of their membership. One example of this is the now infamous video featuring governing body helper Gary Bro, where he unapologetically states that the organization will never 
rescind the two witness rule. If you're unfamiliar with the two witness rule, it's a policy that the organization has, which means that for a sin to be established as taken place, there must either be a confession by the sinner or two witnesses to the sin. This rule even relates to crimes of sexual assault against children. So when this policy started getting media attention, the leadership doubled down and said they'd never change it. Now that's the kind of attitude from the JW leadership that I'm used to. They stubbornly dig their heels in because they are the one true religion, backed by Almighty God himself. So why would they capitulate to mere mortals? But my answer to the question of do they believe is the truth is now different due to the recent policy and doctrinal changes the organization has made. So what are these changes? Firstly, beards are now allowed. Now this might seem like a small and relatively unimportant thing, but for about a hundred years, JW men have been prohibited from growing beards. Now, I must say that this was never a written rule as far as I know. It was more cultural than doctrinal, and the seriousness with which it was enforced varied from place to place. Nevertheless, JW men who wore beards were seldom allowed to hold positions of responsibility in their congregations and were often viewed as bad association or spiritually weak. Another notable policy change which happened recently is the end of ministry reporting for publishers, the rank and file Jehovah's Witnesses. Previously, all JWs who were qualified to preach were required to submit a monthly report of their preaching activity. The report would include how much time they spent preaching during that month, how much literature they dispensed, etc. This requirement has now ended. Now, my assessment of these changes, and please bear in mind that this is just my opinion, is that the JW leadership are trying to make it as easy as possible to remain a Jehovah's Witness so that fewer people have reason to leave the religion. And why would they do that if they sincerely believed it was the one true religion backed by Jehovah God himself? It's long been a point of pride for this religion that they don't compromise their standards or allow themselves to be influenced by the ever-changing popular opinions, styles and trends of the world. And it has always looked very critically at religions that do. It's fair to say that JWs see religious progressivism as capitulation. In fact, as a kid, I remember watching a video produced by the organization called Faith in Action. It was a two-part documentary film, for want of a better word, that traced the origins and history of the religion from the late 1800s right up until the present day. And I can vividly remember Jeffrey Jackson of the governing body, yes, that Jeffrey Jackson of Australian Royal Commission fame, in that video speaking about the religion's stance of not compromising its standards, even if that would mean a reduction in size of the religion's membership. He said in that video, and I quote, Jehovah has never been overly concerned with numbers. Remember that only eight people survived the flood of Noah's day. And this is ultimately why I've changed my mind on this question. I do now believe that most, if not all, of the governing body members no longer believe that they have Jehovah's backing, which is why they've compromised on the aforementioned issues to make it easier for people to stay in the religion. If they truly believed and trusted that Jehovah would turn the little one into a thousand and the small one into a mighty nation, they would not have to compromise their standards to keep their membership stable. The global COVID-19 pandemic dealt a massive blow to the religion in terms of growth, retention, and adherence. The global COVID-19 pandemic dealt a massive blow to the religion in terms of growth, retention, and adherence. For the first time in living memory, Jehovah's Witnesses got off the never-ending hamster wheel en masse. 
And that taste of freedom was enough to make thousands of JWs worldwide practice the religion more loosely, question their beliefs, or leave the religion altogether. And the religion has not and probably will not ever recover. But this situation raises another important question. What now? Is this relaxing of rules a one-off or is it just the beginning of a wave of new changes? We can't know for sure, but personally, I suspect that this is just the beginning. Now, I want to stress that this is just pure speculation. But here are some predictions I have about what might come next. Okay, so prediction number one. Women wearing trousers. After the change in the beard rule, I now see this as a distinct possibility. For those who may not know, JW women and girls are prohibited from wearing trousers during any congregational activities, like public preaching or attending congregation services. This rule is based on a scripture in Deuteronomy 22 verse 5, which prohibited the ancient Israelites from cross-dressing. But I think that this is something that could possibly change since trousers are no longer viewed as a strictly male garment in any country that wears them. The Jehovah's Witness religion places a huge emphasis on appearances. They pay particular attention to how they are viewed by people outside of the religion, the wider world in general. So if a non-Jehovah's Witness today in 2024 was rudely disturbed on a Saturday morning by a knock at their door. They opened the door and were presented with a smartly dressed woman wearing trousers. Would they think that that woman was pretending to be a man? Absolutely not. And that's why I think it's at least possible for this rule to change in the not too distant future. Okay, prediction number two, an emphasis on childbearing. Now, I know that this is a bit of a strange one, but please hear me out. With the exception of the African and South American continents, growth in the religion has been stagnant for several years now, and the door-to-door -door preaching work is DOA at this point. Now, this means that the only realistic way for the religion to grow is through child indoctrination. So it's possible that the JW leadership could start encouraging their members to have more children. More children means more people to indoctrinate, which in turn means growth in the religion. Interestingly, according to a 2016 study by the Pew Research Center, the JW religion has a retention rate of only 33% of all members born into the religion. Now that was the lowest retention rate of any Christian denomination surveyed at the time. So what does this mean in practical terms? It means that if a JW couple has three children, then only one of those children will remain in the religion into adulthood. So statistically speaking, if the couple has six children, that number will increase to two. And if they have nine children, then three of them would remain in the faith. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that the JW leadership is well aware of this statistic and I'm sure they'd like that 33% to be as large a number as possible. Now in the past, the organization has actually advised against having children. The rationale being that we are so close to the end of the system that having children would be an unnecessary distraction from spiritual pursuit. Why have children now so close to the Great Tribulation and the Great War of Armageddon when you could just wait for a short time and have as many babies as you want in a paradise? But it should be obvious to anyone now, even people still in the religion, true believers, that Armageddon isn't coming anytime soon. The governing body knows this too, I'm sure. All you have to do is look at the time, money and effort they're investing into some of their projects, like the Ramapo project, which is like a huge movie production center. It's obvious that they wouldn't be doing these things if they thought really and genuinely that Armageddon was just around the corner. That coupled with the fact that 
people are no longer coming into the religion from outside. The only chance they have of any growth whatsoever is through having more children. Am I right with this prediction? Only time will tell. And that brings us to my third and final prediction, the selling off of all kingdom halls. Admittedly, this last prediction is a bit of a long shot, but since we're speculating, why not just have some fun with it? It's no secret that the governing body has embarked on a program of selling off their real estate in the form of meeting places and consolidating congregations all over the world. So in essence, they've already started this. But with in-person meeting attendance being at an all-time low, is there any point in keeping any kingdom halls at all anymore? We all know how much this organization likes to watch their pennies, so keeping the kingdom halls running is an expensive and somewhat unnecessary overhead. Also, with more and more focus being given to video production and the monthly broadcasts on their website, are we seeing a gradual transition to an online religion? It's definitely possible. Again, only time will tell. Now over to you. What do you think? Does the governing body believe they're leading the one true religion, backed by Jehovah God, or not? Also, what are your predictions for how the religion may or may not change in the foreseeable future? I'd be very interested to know. Feel free to send me an email or contact me on social media. All the details you need to get in touch are in the show notes below. Or if you're listening to this on YouTube, feel free to leave a comment. And that is it for our very first episode of this new Jexit podcast. I really hope you enjoyed it. If so, please like and subscribe. I've got a couple of interviews lined up for this podcast and I hope you'll find them interesting. So please stay tuned. Until next time, this has been the Jexit podcast. Have a great week.